Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Baby, the football playbook. Rick Saratella here. You out there broadcasting live around the universe. It's the biggest, the baddest, the best football show on the planet. God damn it, man. Real football talk when it comes to, what are we, 12 and 1? Let's just call them the 13 and 1. Philadelphia Eagles, the National Football League, college football landscape, NFL draft, and everything transpiring around the football universe. Oh, baby, man. What a day, what a day, what a day. We have got um, the Windy City Showdown is, is, is what, about 50 hours away. Uh, we've been previewing it all week long here on the Football Playbook. We'll get into that. The first power of hour will be strictly dedicated to Philly Dilly Talk, okay? Mike Gill, by the way, joining us at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. He's going to come fly with us here, all presented by the Ocean Casino Resorts, your home. For the Pondland Hockey Eagles pre and post game. Oh, baby, buckle up. It's a double chin strap affair. Hour two, we'll get into a little bit elongated NFL pick them, right? Because there's no more bye weeks. I'm feeling good about the picks. It's going to be a big, big, big bounce back week. And then if we have time at the end of the show, we'll do a little bowl game preview, which kicks off here. Wow. What is it? In an hour or so, I'm going to have to throw the game up. I mean, you know we're in December when I got to throw the, the bowl games up while we're broadcasting live at 11 a.m. Eastern. Oh, man, you're making my day over here. I got football at 11 a.m. I got kegs and eggs on a, on a, on a football Friday affair. woo baby. Tyler Bolich, TB, the real goat. Adams exploits. Buckle up. William Stark. Yes, good morning. Finally, Friday, Jared Ford. Oh, baby, I'm glad you brought your work boots on because we got to – Really work at it, baby. We got to work at it to smash these Chicago Bears. Sean asks, how you doing? Uh, all our chat room people, where you at? In the front, in the back. So happy you could join us here for the 75th edition of the Football Playbook. It is Friday, December 16th. Uh, did you get the Christmas shopping done? You got nine days left to do so. Oh, baby. Buckle up. Oh, Kim's Razor. Uh, morning. Not impressed by the Seahawks at all. I would agree with you. We'll get into... Uh, a little Thursday night football, San Fran 21, Seattle 13. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I think the Seahawks and the Giants look like they're going to fumble their playoff chances, right? And so uh, the 49ers wrapped up the NFC West. Everybody got a T-shirt and hat last night in the locker room. And uh, Justin v Visger says, yo, like it up. Help you boy out. Get our algorithms up. Appreciate the love and support. Uh, it's the realest show on the Jacob Sports Network, right? We don't get into all that fugazi nonsense. We just keep it real. And uh, that's what we got is two hours of power with you here today. Brawlster B, it's been a while, man. Good to see you. Yeah, baby. Um, yeah, I would agree. NFC, uh, 49ers still the biggest threat. We'll get into that in hour two. Let's talk about the three and ten Chicago Bears. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, you know, what I'm excited for most 
in this matchup against Chicago, which I think it'll be another uh, game over by halftime. In fact, I'm going to get over to the sawmill this uh, Sunday. Hopefully my guy, Justin Serrato is out there in the chat room universe. We're going to go over to the, to the pig roast over at the sawmill. It's week, what, 14, week 15. I haven't been over to the sawmill once this year. That's an unheard of feat at the Jersey shore. And for those of you who don't know over here in Seaside, we do the pig roast. We get that pig up roasting 7 a.m., right? And for five bucks, you get the breakfast buffet from 11 to 12. Come back over to the RIC Man Cave Palace. Go back over at halftime. You get the pig roast in. Don't worry. They got a little uh, managot. They got a little lasagna floating around sometimes, a little salmon, whatever you like. So if you're in the Jersey Shore area on Sunday, we will catch you at the sawmill. Hey, January 1st, we'll catch you at the tailgate takeover. It's going down parking lot G at the link for the Saints game. It's going to be a party up in here, man. I'm telling you, uh, can't wait for that. Paul Mancini, happy Friday. Uh, good to see you. We missed you this week down there in the Carolinas. And, uh, yeah, you know, the Bears, what I'm getting into um, – looking forward to most actually is Justin Fields, right? It's time for the Justin Fields litmus test. And uh, I told you, we'll get into some bowl games later on in the show. We got some NFL draft talk in yesterday, man. I got agents and trainers and scouts and, and coaches hitting me up about this NFL PA collegiate bowl coming January 28th, Woo, man. But it's time for the Justin Fields litmus test because this was supposed to be a franchise quarterback. I liked Justin Fields coming out of college. And I really think maybe if Matt Rule had selected or drafted uh, Justin Fields coming out, maybe he'd still be employed by the Carolina Panthers. I thought that was the way to go. And uh, I'm really getting um, excited to see Justin Fields with an up close look where we will have eyes on him for a full four quarters. Well, if I'm going over to the sawmill and it's over by halftime for a full two quarters at least. And then it's going to be Gardner Menchu time. <laughs> it's going to be Gardner Fu Man Menchu time. <laughs> um, Jared, I mean, listen, this is this is this is borderline a foodie show. Uh, last name Saratella. So we talk it up. The Dolce. That's another pit stop I got to get down to. Uh, we're doing the tailgate takeover. I got to get over to a pre and post game show. JM. The Bears pundits are saying Fields isn't smart enough to read a defense. Well, we shall see. We'll find out this week. Uh, it's kind of hard to gauge when uh, the pass rush is getting back to Justin Fields just as fa fast as the ball snap, right? Uh, <laughs> Yo, we do it in a pit, O'Cam's Razor. Uh it goes on the pig roast kind of like a rotisserie chicken style. It just drips and drips and drips. And, you know, they started, they, they fired up around 7 a.m. They serve it at uh, halftime of the one o'clock game. So 2.30, they put it up there for about eight hours on the pit roast. Oh, baby. Little barbecue sauce. Now, granted, it ain't it ain't like Paul Mancini's uh, North Carolina barbecue. But, hey, what do you want out of life at the Jersey Shore? Huh? Uh, Dak 2.0 in here with the Micah Parsons chit chat. Um, no, it'll be interesting with, with uh, a dual threat. I mean, Daniel Jones, I thought they did extraordinary well last week. Sariani talking about disciplined rush lanes and they'll, they'll need that again with Justin Fields again. Uh, I don't think he seems lame, JM. I, I, I think Justin Fields has flashed glimpses of potential. Now, again, I'm, am I sitting down watching the Bears games from start to finish? Not really. That's why I'm excited to see it, what it looks like. Not just the highlights, not just these flash splash plays where Fields is running uh, through the defenses. By the way, it ain't happening this week, but uh, 95 yards Justin Fields needs um, to surpass 1,000 yards rushing now. I don't think it's happening this week. He's going to have to wait another week. But um, 95 yards will make him just the third quarterback in NFL history to surpass 1,000 yards rushing. And Lamar Jackson has done it. Michael Vick has done it. 
Uh, Jalen Hurts might be joining him later on in the season as the fourth quarterback. So, you know, the thing is, the the, the, the Bears, what they do is use a lot of pre-snap motion. So what you're going to see is a lot of pre-snap motion, try to throw the Eagles defense off. And again, that's why you got to stay disciplined in those pass rush lanes. But what the Bears like to do is run a lot of pre-snap motion. And then they call a lot of designed runs for Justin Fields. They will, uh, of course, have a lot of improvised runs by Justin Fields. Um, But most importantly, similar to the Eagles, they are very dependent on the running backs and wide receivers to block, right? So Chase Claypool, the receiver receiving numbers haven't looked gaudy, but he has played a key role in the blocking when it's Fields or this week, David Montgomery. Now, I saw Kevin Pearson was on the Birds 365 show, which was great because he does a good job. He had told us earlier in the week that Khalil Herbert probably was not going to be active. Now, I heard he's eligible to come off the IR this week. I have not heard anything to contradict what Kevin told us, but there's an outside shot that Khalil Herbert is activated off the IR. It's not really going to make a difference. It's not going to make a difference. But um, the other thing here to keep an eye on is the third down efficiency that Justin Fields runs this offense with. Uh, They are converting 45% of their third downs. So that's sixth best in the NFL, by the way. And, you know, Justin Fields, I think, is probably the factor there, right? Because he can beat you with his arm occasionally. He will beat you with the feet. So when the Bears are in third and manageable, right, They've been converting that on 45% of the time. Um, Now, I said Justin Fields can beat you occasionally through the air. Hasn't been great. Hasn't been great. Uh, They do have the worst. Now, you've got the best rushing offense in the league, which is almost 190 rushing yards per game. The Eagles are second but they're like 20 yards behind the bears rushing average. Um, They're dead last. When you got the best rushing offense, usually your passing offense is, is is putrid. Well, the bears have the worst Um, 140 passing yards per game. I believe Jalen hurts will have that at halftime. And for those of you at home keeping track, 234 and a half is the over-under for Jalen Hurts passing yardage. I think I think ultimately he'll go under because he probably won't play the fourth quarter. Second half will be a lot of ground and pound, long gated drives. But I do think he'll probably have more Jalen Hurts will probably have more passing yards at halftime than Justin Fields has the entire game. So what I said, though, is Justin Fields has gotten better. The last four games, and the Bears, you know, they, they've they lost all these close games, but they have lost six in a row. It's a hungry team. I just don't know if they have the talent to pull off the upset. I don't see it. But what we have here. Over the last four games for Justin Fields, it's gotten better. The passing yardage isn't great. He's got 700 passing yards over the last four, but the the accuracy, the percentage has been more efficient. 63 for 94. He's completing 67% of his passes um, over the last four games. So... What's concerning is, despite <laughs> despite the 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 uh, elusiveness of the one Justin Fields in the pocket, 
the Bears have allowed the fifth most sacks, 42 sacks. That's a lot of sacks. Um, so going up against an Eagles team that's coming off back to back six sack. What did we call them? The, the sack pack. Yeah, the sack pack. Don't look now, but back to back games of six plus sacks that hasn't been done since 1998 98 time to set it straight <laughs> taking me back to my Hanover Park days Justin Serato um yeah Fields Claypool Montgomery now popping up with an illness I know Fields was on the injury report with an illness earlier in the week so hey <laughs> love the chat room banter baby it's going it's going good it's going fast i'm trying to keep up with you um so you know listen the bears o line is allowed 42 sacks the sack pack they're coming off a ferocious performance and i'm looking at you i'm looking at you braxton jones ohio state products he is the human turnstile that Braxton Jones. And if you want my candidate for, you know, Brandon Graham was your NFC defensive player of the week in week number 14. I've got a strong odds on candidate for week 15. And his name is Josh Sweat. Because Sweat, he drew the lucky straw this week. Uh, Braxton Jones, okay, and Larry Boram, who started uh, seven games at right tackle this year, also injured. I don't think he's playing either. Eddie Jackson, out. Darnell Mooney, out. This is a banged-up team, boy. Um, Braxton Jones probably can't sleep at night right now, for real. Because Braxton Jones, you want to talk about abuse? You're going to see it on Sunday. Josh Sweat's going to take his lunch like a schoolyard bully. Hate to say it. It's happening. Look at this. Look at this. We marvel. We marvel at Lane Johnson. He has not allowed a sack all season. More impressively, he has not allowed a quarterback pressure. All season. That's incredible. Think about that. Yo. Lane Johnson hasn't allowed a quarterback pressure all year. Let me introduce you to Braxton Jones. Let's let's take a moment to appreciate Lane Johnson. Because let me tell you Braxton Jones stat line. On the season. My man. Braxton. Where you at? Six sacks allowed. 24 hurries allowed. And we talk about Lane Johnson has not allowed a quarterback pressure all season. I think that's the truth. This mofo allowed 33 quarterback pressures in one season. <laughs> 33. What? 33 quarterback pressures allowed? Wow. Josh Sweat's about to feast. <laughs> Great. I'm uh, unprofessional. Hey, I'm trying to be great like you, brother. Some of us have uh, situations. <laughs> yeah, Lane, man, that's something else. By the way, did you get your Eagles Christmas album today? They went on sale again at 9 a.m. If you didn't, you snooze, you lose. Uh, they were releasing another limited edition today at 9 a.m. The first release sold out in two minutes back on December 9th. So they had to produce some more. Did you get yours? Man, put them on eBay. You make some money. Hey, I see some newbies in the chat room. Emmanuel, welcome to the show. Buckle up. Great. Appreciate you uh, chiming in. Can't stop, won't stop situation. Last season for Fletcher Cox. It's going to be tough. If he if he's willing to take a pay cut, Emmanuel, maybe there'll be room. But remember, 
you've got to sign Javon Hargrave up front, right? And you have a a, a really natural replacement uh, being groomed in Jordan Davis. So I don't think Fletcher Cox is a priority. But if he wants to hang around on a one-year deal for $6 million, sure, you can hang out for another year. But that defense especially, man, I like to the, I'd like to see the Eagles sign Bradbury over Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. You can't sign both. Each guy is going to want about $15 million per year. I think you let Kaiser White and you and you, you have N'Kobe Dean in the mix for next year. Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, I bring them back on team-friendly deals. Javon Hargrave, the year he's having, is going to command big, big bucks. Javon Hargrave might command more money than any – free agent defensive player the Eagles have. So Fletcher Cox is a low priority, quite frankly, unfortunately. And, you know, I saw Fletcher Cox, Lane Johnson, Jason Kelsey, Brandon Graham. You know what they have in common? Only 25 players have played over a hundred games in the NFL all with the same team. The Eagles have four of them pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, JM, if Gannon gets a, a, a head coaching job, who's the front runner for defensive coordinator? I would say Vic Fangio. Cause at what 60 years old, If you look at the latest trend around the league, it's all going, it's all trending younger. And I talked to a lot of uh, decision makers. They all want the next young up and comer. It's all about youth in the 2022 NFL. Uh, Vic Fangio is not going to get another head coaching gig. So he can either moonlight and be this consultant. I think he's had like 23 teams on the payroll this year as a quote unquote consultant. Maybe that's the better route for Vic Fangio because he just, does a little training camp tour in August and he's kind of on line one, ready to go. But I would, I would be looking at Vic Fangio. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think Fangio had his opportunity just like Frank Reich and teams are going to go in the younger direction. I think guys like Gannon and Steichen relatively young. That's, that's what teams are looking for. And for what it's worth, I do like Gannon. Um, I think Gannon's the stronger candidate, not because of scheming and game calling, because of the DNA. If you watch his pressers, like you you sit down in a room with Jonathan Gannon, I can tell you what, he's going to have you nodding your head like, you know, like you're rocking out to a Fat Joe song because you're like, yeah. Yeah, I like the analogy. I like what you're about. I like what you're talking, Jonathan Gannon. Now, his defensive scheme leaves a lot to be desired, but it's hard to uh, argue with the results. Go Sixers. I think Frank Reich would be the leading candidate uh, if Shane Steichen does get a gig. I do. I think Frank Reich and Vic Fangio could very well be on this staff next year. Absolutely. You know, I don't think Fangio would have personnel decision-making influence, but, you know, it's the chicken or the egg conversation. I think it's a case-by-case situation. I think it's not really do you value the defensive line or the secondary more. It's do you – how do you value Javon Hargrave versus James Bradbury versus Chauncey Gardner-Johnson? To me, Bradbury is the most valuable piece to this Eagles roster. Cause again, I could let Hargrave walk away, bring back Fletcher Cox. And I got Jordan Davis. Maybe I bring back Linville Joseph. I'm good. I lose James Bradbury. I don't know where I'm finding a guy like that. I got to use that number four overall selection on Kaylee Ringo out of Georgia or Joey Porter out of Penn state. Right. Yeah, Ben Johnson could get elevated. He could also be a candidate for a head coaching job. Elden Ring, what's up, Paisan? Thank you. Good to see you. Daz Deals, it's been a while.
Yeah, I mean, listen, of course Frank Reich wants a head coaching job. Any uh, aspiring coordinator like Frank Reich, who's a football lifer, of course he wants to be a head coach. I don't see it for him. I just don't see it. We had Brian Baldinger on. He don't see it either. And Baldy's a big fan of Frank Reich. He's friends with Frank Reich. Bradbury, yeah, three years, $50 million deal. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll give Bradbury a two-year deal. I'll give him a two-year deal for $30 million, Paul. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson is scheduled to return for the Saints game, DJ. We shall see. Daz Deal says Will Anderson or Jalen Carter is coming to Philly. I don't think Will Anderson's a fit in this scheme. I, I view... Will Anderson, there's some concerns there with the frame and the bulk. And he. I think Will Anderson's more of a, a – well, I guess he could fit. Uh, he he would play the Hassan Reddick role. He'd have to stand up, though. Jalen Carter, that's the dude. Like, Jalen Carter would have been the number one overall pick in last year's draft if he was draft eligible. A lot of Cowboys and 49ers fans up in here today. We'll get into the banter. Hey. Uh, Rick Saratella here, you out there, the chat room's on fire. We got Tone the Shields at the second, holding it down, the super producer. Um, let's do this. We'll take a quick break. Come back. I got injury updates for the Eagles, injury updates for the Bears. Um, speaking of that defensive line, I got some interesting stuff on Linville Joseph and Nadama Kongsu. Uh, I got some unsung heroes to get into, some more Eagles key to victories. Hey, we're just getting started here, man. Fire it up. Take a quick break. It's all brought to you by the Ocean Casino Resorts. Smash that like button on your way out. We'll see you right here on the way back in in two minutes. Post game show with Seth Joyner. I knew that they had a running game. Derek Gunn. He has put in the effort. Devin Caney. Had we not won the Super Bowl, what would we be saying? And Mike Missanelli. Well, you know how Philly is. Post game, now streaming on the 6ABC family of apps. greatest fans on earth it's a bold statement but would you expect anything less from philadelphia 58 years of heartache creates a toughness a grit a resolve not found in most sure our prayers were answered but now that we've had a taste we're looking for more pondley hockey official partner of the philadelphia eagles Number one, Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown is rolling back prices for a December to remember. For a limited time, you can own, not lease, brand new 2023 Jeep Wranglers for only $39.95 or $339 per month. New Rams starting at only $39.95 or new Ram 1500 Bighorn Crew Cabs $189 per month. Zero down can deliver. Get the price you want, the selection you need, and the VIP treatment you deserve. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, big finish sales event. Did you know taxes could be your biggest expense during retirement? Are most of your assets in tax-deferred accounts like IRAs and 401ks? Taxes are historically low today, but we're facing significant headwinds in the future. Do you have a plan? The Thrive Financial Team has more than 100 years of experience helping people across the Delaware Valley with forward-looking tax planning. Learn how to shift your money from forever tax to no or low tax accounts. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Go for the beers, go for the cheers, go for the hit and the hits, go for the scene, go for the screens, go for the gallery, go for the win, go to ocean.
Back at it again. It's the football playbook with your boy RIC and the place to be. We're dealing over here on the football playbook, our 75th edition on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. Click subscribe, get all of our show notification alerts, smash that like button. We're getting it in. It's a can't stop, won't stop situation. We're just getting started, counting you down to the sports take at 12 o'clock Eastern time here. Woo, double chin strap affair. And man, we got a football Friday cameo. I had so much fun chopping it up and breaking it down with Mike Gill of the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. We had to have him back because he is, of course, the Sportscaster of the Year nominee. Already won the award once. We're going to win that award again. Good morning, Mike. How are we doing today? What's up, Rick? Yes, we are pushing hard to try to win for a second time. Yeah, man, the people's champion, Mike Gill, right here, right now. And I, I felt a little bad about bringing you on the show today because you said it was your day off. I'm like, man, I'm making the guy come on and work on his day off. But I know the chat room's happy. Well, I'm on vacation for most of the rest of the year. So these little cameos give me a chance to at least, uh, you know, dip my toe in the water and give a couple thoughts for the people. I'm a man of the people, Rick. Is that right? You're on vacation for the, I guess when you're the broadcaster of the year, you get that kind of paid vacation, huh? Um, I am off today and then I'm working Monday. I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I'm on Thursday, Friday, and then I'm off the rest of the year after that. <laughs> I need the Mike Gill schedule in my life. And of course, I know Mondays you're down at the Ocean Casino Resorts, I believe, two to six, right? Yep. That's why I'm working, man. I can't miss a day at the Ocean. So I'll be there Monday. And uh, yeah, we're going to chop it up after Eagles Bears. The one day I won't be on is the Monday after Eagles Dallas, which I'm a little, uh, you know, a little sad about, but it is what it is, man. You'll be celebrating. Don't worry about it. You'll have the eggnog flowing. You'll be, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be popping it up, chopping it up. By the way, how's the Mike Gill Christmas experience going? We're like nine days away. Are we? Complete? You know, I used to be, I used to be a, um, so I would basically be a Christmas Eve guy. Like I would go out and scout stuff. And then on Christmas Eve, I'd go back to all the spots and swoop them all up. I'm, I'm doing a little bit more online now. I've done a couple days out because I was off on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. I'm hoping to finish up tomorrow. Oh, okay. Get it done. That'd be sweet. Yeah, I, I, I was notoriously known to be a Christmas Eve uh, Christmas shopper. You get a lot of discounts and bargains, right? But, you know, this year my daughter's put me on the spot with this Paw Patrol lookout tower, man. I'm like, what if I wait last second and Toys R Us sells out? Then I can't order it online because it's going to be like a day or two late. So I got I better buckle up and get it. I know we're we are. My girlfriend and I are like teetering around the what's the date that's too late to get it here in time or that if they say they're going to get it here Christmas Eve, but something happens. So at this point, is today the day you actually have to go out and buy it instead of order it online? Is this like the cutoff? Yeah, I think I'll be making a trip over to Lakewood. They got a Toys R Us over there. I got to get it in this weekend. And the Eagles are going to get it in, I believe, out in Chicago, the Windy City Showdown. Uh, let's talk about it. Let's be about it here on the Football Playbook, Mike. Strap them up, lace them up. Uh, of course, the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN Radio, Mike Gill in the building, uh, online at least. So to me, you know, the Bears have very little talent. Uh, their offensive line is like a turnstile. They're allowing a lot of sacks. Justin Fields is kind of running around scrambling for his life. Uh, a lot of injuries. Darnell Mooney's out. Eddie Jackson's out. You look on the defensive side, not a whole heck of a lot going on there either. Uh, is this just a second half B squad romper room uh, here on this Sunday? Well, defensively, Chicago was probably the worst team in the league. I mean, period, point blank. They can't stop anything. Their secondary's got some talent, but they're young. They don't rush the passer a lick. They're the worst team in football when it comes to that. Obviously, they made a couple trades that, depl that depleted that area. Uh, defensively, they're horrible. So, yeah, I mean, you could theoretically pick your poison. You can run the ball all day on this team if you feel like it. You can take shots down the field and beat them that way. You should be able. Now, it's going to be cold out there, a little windy, uh, in the Windy City. So we'll see if they want to go to the run game, which could, uh, you know, stretch this game out a little bit. But yeah, defensively, they're horrendous. Uh, they don't have a lot of weapons, a lot like the Giants. They just don't have a downfield weapon. 
Uh, they don't run the ball particularly well like the Giants do, and the Eagles handled the Giants' run. They handled the Tennessee's run. I think we all got a little worried after what Washington did. Well, they've kind of squashed the run game. Uh, Green Bay ran the ball on them a, a little bit, but um, the one guy is Fields. I mean, Fields closing in on 1,000 yards rushing. He could get that in the game on Sunday. He would be the one concern. If he's running around – and making plays happen and just kind of keeping them around, that would be the only way I think this game, I don't say hangs in the balance, but keeps the Bears thinking they have a, a shot, but they just can't get a stop. I don't think they'll get a stop on. You might not see – I know the Eagles have signed a new punter. You might not meet him this week. Yeah. No, I know. We talked about that. Maybe uh, they got to have a punter on the active man roster, I guess, but they won't necessarily need him. I will say – I'll give the Bears a little bit extra glimmer of hope with this Cole Komet. He's a big-bodied red zone mismatch. You know, you got Chauncey Gardner-Johnson still out. Reed Blankenship's going to miss some time. Who's going to start at safety? Maybe the Bears look to exploit that matchup, but I don't think it matters much unless you get down to the red zone because Cole Komet really isn't, you know, breaking off big chunks of yardage. He's just no. more of a uh, possession-type kind of receiver, tight end. Yeah, and, and, you know, we talk about the tight ends a lot during the course of the year. The Eagles, have in their past, have had problems with the tight end. They really haven't had problems with the tight end this year. That, that you know, Kaiser White and TJ Edwards, Edwards has gotten so much better in coverage. I mean, that is where he has been able to stay on the field and be a three-down backer, is that he in coverage is just outstanding. Uh, and White is an athletic guy, so they have two really good linebackers in coverage. So the tight end, I mean, name a tight end that's really – hurt them this year I mean in the in the past years it was almost weekly that the tight end was getting you that has kind of been the one area that I think last week we talked about was Daniel Jones could he make something happen with his feet he got minimal yardage on the ground and that goes back to the to the Houston game where Tannehill had a lot of yards rushing and they were just a couple broken down plays where he took off it was like two or three plays and then of course because as Eagles fans out there are looking for so much to kind of, well, there's got to be something wrong with this team, right? Well, the quarterback gets a lot of yards. That was one game. So, yes, I think Fields can can get his yards, but I'm not all that concerned about the tight end. Uh, Komet's a guy that I actually had high expectations for him. I think he's kind of disappointed to some extent this year, and it could be a product of they don't really have a lot of other things in that offense. I really liked him. Uh, back in August, I thought he was going to be a big time uh, receiving tight end for them. And he has not turned into that. Uh, the run game, you lose in Montgomery. And I mean, they just have nothing in the run game. It, this team, look, they had a little spurt when Fields kind of was playing well and they were running the ball. Uh, they had a little spurt going. But I think <laughs> the injuries and the trades and everything, this team is just – they're a different team at home. I'll give them that. They're a little bit better at home. But – Last week, Rick, we saw the NFL. You don't see talent disparity on television all that much. Teams scheme up ways to kind of close the gap there. Last week, the Eagles and the Giants, you clearly saw deficient talent on one side of the ball against a team that was clearly more talented. By the way, you didn't see that in the Dallas-Houston game, but... You saw it in the Philadelphia Giants game. I think you're going to see that again in the game this week. The Eagles' talent disparity over the Bears is just too great for the Bears to overcome with one guy running around uh, trying to make plays by himself. No, I'm telling you, we've been seeing 40 burgers the last three weeks. We might see a 50 burger this week. I'm Dude, just they scored – they're averaging 41 points a game the last three games without Goddard. What's going to happen? Now, I'm not going to sit here and suggest you're just going to start scoring 40 points a game because Goddard's back. But we kept kind of, as this season was matriculating, they were having big second quarters, and then they were kind of not scoring. Once they all kind of get together, that really hasn't happened yet, where the whole offense is clicking at the same time. We're running. We're throwing. Brown's a part of it. Smith's a part of it. Goddard's a part of it. Sanders is a part of it. Er we haven't seen a game or a stretch where everybody's healthy and all rolling at the same time. No, I would agree. And I think, you know, this is a week where you might start to see some of that Dallas Goddard back into the fold. And uh, I don't know, Mike, I thought it was Goddard missing time was almost a blessing in disguise because you saw 
uh, no tight end sets. You saw empty backfields. You saw Quez Watkins and Zach Pascal get involved a little bit more. You saw Grant Calcaterra was capable both as a pass catcher and a blocker. And you saw Jack Stoll like, yeah, he he's not a world beater out there, but he's not he, uh, no as a notorious blocker. He ain't gonna get you hurt in the passing game either. He only had three catches all season. Goddard goes down, and he's had about seven or eight catches over the last month or so. To me, I feel like Shane Steichen kind of diversified the offense with Goddard being out. Yeah, and now it's almost like a, a more potent Eagles offense getting ready to. Go into the playoffs. Well, what they've used the tight end is in a more traditional manner where they've used him to block and then they've used him to just kind of sit. You know, he'll sit at the sticks and they catch that pass right and they go right down. The difference with Goddard is he'll catch that pass, reverse spin out, and get himself some yards up the field. He's great with the yak. The other guys, they're just catching the ball and literally going down. So the tight end is a more traditional use in the offense where. They have now been able to get Watkins a little bit more involved. I think it's interesting. Remember the game against the Colts? We were like, and this is a, I think there's been a lot of talk about Hertz this week and his MVP candidacy and why, and is he the part, and then all the Parsons nonsense. You lose a weapon like Dallas Goddard. I mean, he's one of the top three to five receiving tight ends in football, and Hertz sneezed at it. Like he wasn't, I mean, the first game, yeah, they had a rough going. And then after that, okay, you take away Goddard, I'll figure out another way to get you. That, is, to me, is another example of why Hertz has evolved so much. Is Here's a guy who had 53 targets, 14 yards, or 13 and a half yards to catch something like that. You took that out of their offense, and they scored 40 points a game over the last three games. Uh, what does that say about where this offense is? It says, you know what? We can slice and dice you whichever which way you want, and this Sunday will be a perfect example. You want the pass? We got you. You want the run? We got you. Like Dion, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm well, coming. unlike unlike Dion, this team could cover and tackle. They could <laughs> pass and run. You know, Dion was great, but he couldn't tackle a lick. This team can do both things on offense. If you All want, right, to well, let's our- talk about the tackling though, because that came up in Jonathan Gannon's presser again this week, and. He said, I like to think we improved in tackling. Didn't sound the most confident about the the improved tackling on the defense. But as we know, the Chicago Bears have the number one run defense. That week before they signed Linville Joseph and Nadama Kong Sue and and Fletcher Cox was playing like 70, 80 snaps, we were saying, hey, the run defense, the run defense, it's a little bit of a concern here. Well, they went out, they brought in some – reinforcements, some heavy artillery, should we call them? And then they just start chopping down Jonathan Taylor's last year leading rusher, King Henry, Saquon Barkley. And now this week with uh, the Bears, the number one run offense in the NFL, um, man, this defensive line rotation, we're calling them the, 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 the sack pack, like the rat pack, yeah, you know, the sack pack. I don't know. We're down at the Ocean Casino, living it up, a little Atlantic City. I guess we got to figure out who's playing Dean, who's playing Frankie, you know. Um, But what do you make of this situation here? And I saw Linville and Sue, they actually have some uh, performance clause bonuses if they play 30 percent of the snaps and win playoff games. And uh, to me, I I think it's safe to say they kind of shored up all the run defense concerns. Yeah, there's no question. And and you know, that's the thing. Everybody since the Washington game, it keeps coming up on my show. It's, well, can they follow the blueprint of Washington? They could if the Eagles coaching staff was inept. They're not. John Gannon, whether people in the chat or people watching or people who see this later on, whether you like it or not, John Gannon's a pretty smart guy and he's very good coordinator. He saw what Washington did and said, you ain't doing that again to us. So if you want to follow that blueprint, that's a losing proposition. Teams that say, we're going to just try to run the ball on you. The Eagles have now, look, the Jordan Davis injury ended up being a blessing in disguise because, and by proxy, um, you know, uh, uh, Tui Peloto got hurt as well. They had to do something. They had to go on the street and find somebody. Those two injuries actually ended up being a blessing because they had to go out and bring in these two veteran players. And Joseph has played so well. 
that he has essentially taken over snaps from Jordan Davis because Davis doesn't look like he's quite ready to contribute and come back, but it's good to kind of get him slowly reincorporated. But that Washington game, people thought there was a blueprint to follow. There's a blueprint to follow if your coaching staff allows you to continue to follow that blueprint. The Eagles said, you're not following that blueprint, so figure out another way to beat us. And so far since that game, no one else has been able to figure stuff out because the Eagles have tweaked and done such a good job. And look, the depth they have on that defensive line, I mean, Joseph, uh, the job that he has done since coming in, I mean, it, it's been unbelievable. He takes up the two blockers. He fills the gap. But Hargrave and Cox have upped their games. Brandon Graham looks like he's got the fountain of youth uh, coming off the edge. Sweat has been outstanding, by the way. Josh Sweat has played some great football over the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, that defensive front, it's very reminiscent to what they had going in, in 17, where they just kept rotating fresh guys at you constantly and getting the best snaps out of them. Yeah, I know Sue is getting some praise in the chat room. I would argue Linville Joseph has played the better of the two. I think Linville is playing himself into a contract coming back next year. Yeah. And, by the way, Sweat draws the Braxton Jones assignment uh, we talked about being a human turnstile, man. This guy has given up six sacks, 24 hurries, and 33 quarterback pressures. 33, Mike. Yeah, I mean, well, their, their line struggles. There's no question about it. Um, I think Reddick's the guy to watch this week, too. Reddick is another guy who I think it took Gannon a couple of weeks to figure out what was the best way to use him, but I think they've kind of figured out you know, how to use him now. Um, you know, Last year, we looked at Gannon – they didn't have the personnel that they wanted to run his defense. Now, some people would say, if you don't have the personnel to run your defense, do something different. Uh, they tried to tweak and do some things as the year went on to kind of, you know, do what they had. But you remember the whole situation last year where Fletcher Cox said, oh, they pay me to sack the quarterback. Well, Gannon was trying to use Fletcher Cox as like the Linval Joseph. That was not working. And they did not have a nose on the team last year. So he could not really run the concepts that he wanted to run. So they went out and got Jordan Davis. Now they have Joseph. But I think the key to this Gannon defense has been not only having that nose, but James Bradbury is significantly better than Steve Nelson. Steve Nelson, they really had to play those corners so far, Nelson off the ball, because you know, Gannon's defense predicated on not giving up the big play. You're not going to beat us over the top. Well, they were so afraid of getting beat over the top with Nelson that they had to play him so far off the ball, and teams just picked and went after him all season long over there, and their safeties were not great last year either. So I think Gannon certainly has adjusted to having much better talent to fit his scheme, and I think you're seeing as this thing is coming together now, it is, quite frankly – other than San Francisco, trying to think off the top of my head real fast, I don't know that there's a better overall unit in the game. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, one guy I want to shine a little love on, uh, Milton Williams, too. I thought played his best game of the season last week against the Giants. So uh, the Eagles' defensive line is gelling. You know, I want to, I want to go back to that Washington game, though, because you said, you know, the, the Jordan Davis was an uh, uh, injury was a blessing in disguise. In a way, Dallas Goddard injury was a blessing in disguise. Let me ask you this, Mike. Was the Quez Watkins dropped touchdown in that Washington game a blessing in disguise? Because otherwise we would have been talking about a 13-0 Philadelphia team getting set to head into Chicago. And if they had not lost – Maybe they're playing their starters against the Saints and the Giants. Maybe they're not resting their starters. Maybe there's a little bit more pressure heading in to the playoffs. Do you think it was a blessing or disguise, or would you rather have this team on the brink of uh, undefeated history? That's a good question because it, there is this balance of like we be talking here, oh, the, can they go undefeated? Do you even want to go undefeated? There's a whole other thing that's coming up here. You know, because if they won that Washington game, that drop pass really changed the dynamic. They could win this game against the Bears and essentially have the things pretty secure here. Instead, they have to beat the Bears and then beat Dallas next week. Then the question after that, if they did beat the Bears this week, which I think they will handily, uh, and then they beat Dallas on New on Christmas Eve. Number one seed is clinched. You would be the number one seed. 
the New Year's Day game against the Saints, meaningless. The Bear, the Giant game on the final Sunday of the year or Saturday, that game has not been scheduled yet, meaningless. Then you would have a bye. You're talking about possibly three straight weeks. It's almost like a preseason where you would not play, and then you would face Dallas most likely again in the divisional round. That's a long time off with not having a lot of meaningful snaps for this team. So, um, yeah, if you would have won that Washington game, you could essentially have closed the deal this week, and then the Dallas game wouldn't have had a lot of meaning. So I think losing that game is helpful. You don't want to talk about And let's listen. There's been a lot of talk about where this Eagles team already ranks in the pantheon of great Eagles teams. Now, we know in Philadelphia only one Super Bowl, so not a lot of great Eagles teams to compare to, but a lot of talented teams that came up short. If you really wanted to say this is the greatest Eagles talent roster of all time and want to put them in the pantheon of great teams of all time, then you would have been rooting for an undefeated season with the Super Bowl. I don't know that this team is on that level, so it's probably better that they got that out of the way, right? Uh, I, I like to watch Mercury Morris uh, squirm every week. I don't know. <laughs> right. I will say, for whatever it's worth, I still put the 1960 Eagles team up top. I think the 2017 team is second. But I do think if this team runs the table, I, I think it will be the greatest. The 2017 team and this team are, have a lot of similarities. I think the old- well because that team was scrapping and clawing. They were they truly were an underdog, right? They were a wild card, I think. No, that team was the number one seed. Were they the number one? Okay. Well, that was the year that Wentz got hurt, and they were the number one seed because they raced out to like an eleven and three record with Wentz. He got hurt, and they got the number one seed. But they got they were the underdogs in the playoffs because Foles was the quarterback. But they were the number one seed that year. But it was because – and that team had a lot of injuries. They lost Jason Peters. They lost the linebackers. That Ronald Darby, they traded for him, and then he dislocated his ankle and missed 10 weeks, so they were playing with, like, Jalen Watkins. Um, they had a lot of injuries on that Super Bowl team and ended up winning, and that was the whole underdog thing. But they were the number one seed in the playoffs that you could remember – they had a home game against Atlanta. They barely won that game. The pass goes through Julio Jones' hands in the back of the end zone on the final throw of the game from Matt Ryan. They beat Minnesota the next week at home. They uh, they get that interception from Patrick Robinson, and the whole game shifts right there, and they crush Minnesota, and then they win the Super Bowl, obviously. The 0-4 team is an interesting one to compare. You know, McNabb and Owens, um, that team was loaded. Um, and obviously Owens gets hurt and he comes back for the Super Bowl. He has a heroic game. But uh, this team talent wise, I think, is more comparable to the 17 team than I haven't really thought much about the 04. It keeps because Brandon Graham brought it up. He was on somewhere the other day. He brought it up. And then um, it was Darren Sproles brought it up somewhere talking mm-hmm. about the 17 team and this team. And Graham was kind of diplomatic about it because he was on both teams. So. But keep in mind, you had a Graham that year that was four or five years younger than this Graham. You had Cox on that team that was a little younger than this version. Uh, These corners are way better. These corners are significantly better than the corners on that team. You had Malcolm uh, playing safety on that team with um, Rodney McLeod. I think those safeties were better than the – although, you know who doesn't get mentioned at all, Rick? Marcus Epps. No, his name has not been mentioned at all all season long, and yeah. he has had a really solid year. He has played ninety nine percent of the snaps. I'll give him that. He is an Iron Man, and he's an overachiever, and he's a notorious hard worker. But he does have limitations, Mike. You know, um, I, I've seen him get beaten coverage. I've seen him uh, with a lot of missed tackles, and quite frankly, like the the back end secondary when Chauncey and Epps are both in there they're both a little bit timid to step up and make the the tackle in the open field. That's just what I've seen. But I I will say from expectations, he has exceeded them. Well, right. I mean, because in training camp, the safety position was one of the huge question marks because Epps was thought to be the best guy they had. And he was an unknown player. The safety spot really has not been. Now, of course they went out and got Chauncey Gardner Johnson at the start, right before the season started. 
but he had not played a lot of safety either, and he kind of solidified that group with his playmaking ability. But Epps has kind of been a solid guy. But to go back, the safeties on the 04, uh, the 17 team were collectively better. The defensive lines were similar. The linebackers on this team are, are excellent. Uh, Edwards has changed the dynamic of the way. It's another part of Gannon being able to now trust his linebackers. Could not do that last year. Those guys were pitiful. I mean, quite frankly, uh, that was a sad. Now, I know TJ Edwards was a part of that linebacker group last year. He has gotten so much better. But Kaiser White is significantly better than Alex Singleton. And we talked about on my show yesterday, and this is more, you know, now we're four beers in having this conversation, right? Would the defense actually be better if Nicobe Dean was the starter? Is he a better? Look, I'm a West Virginia guy. Kaiser White, baby. I was pumped when they signed him because I thought he would really help this defense. Mm -hmm. But is Nicobe Dean actually, would he actually be a better? Would that make the defense better if he played? I think for next year it will be. I, I well, think we're going to see because they're not going to bring both those guys back. Correct. And I, I think, you know, at this stage of his development, like you can't teach, you know, no, nothing replaces in-game experience, right? Like Kaiser White, he's faced the flying bullets. N'Kobe Dean, I like what I've seen. And I was on the yeah. show yesterday saying I think it makes Kaiser White very disposable at the end of the season. N'Kobe Dean played 15 plays in that game two weeks ago and led the team in tackles. Think about that. Well, uh, and well, I think two or three came on special teams, right? Or... Uh, maybe, possibly. But I will say this. He made two plays back-to-back, -back and I said, who the hell is number 17? I hadn't seen him all year long. I said, is Alshon Jeffrey out there playing defense? Who is 17? He was decisive, quick to the football. He had his keys, read them quickly, went right to the back. I mean, look – it's all obviously, like I said, now we're six beers deep having this conversation. He's better. No, I, I just think that um, this team has a lot of depth, which is what the 17 team had as well. Guy gets hurt. Next guy comes in and the team. So like, this team has the depth. Um, you know, this offensive line, I think, is better than the 17 team. Because remember, Peters went out. Vitae went in. Wisniewski went in at guard. And he was the third guard on that team. They had Sayamala there, and he was not playing well. They replaced him with Chance Warmack, and Warmack was horrible. So they finally went to Wisniewski. Uh, the rest of the line was, I, I think, this pretty much uh, you had Kelsey, you had Johnson. Oh, you had Brandon Brooks playing right guard on that team. This line is much more steady, much more congruent. They play together a lot. A.J. Brown – is better than any receiver. I know Alshon was probably at his height that season, but A.J. Brown better than Alshon. Uh, Devonta Smith is clearly better than Torrey Smith, and the tight ends are kind of a wash, Goddard and Ertz. And I think this running game with Sanders is probably a more elusive back than the duo of LeGarrette, Blunt, and Jay Ajayi. Yeah, I think the skill position uh, players are definitely much better. Uh, Mike, I wanted to pick your brain on a couple games before we get you out of here, but quickly, uh, one word answers are fine. Is it Kayvon Wallace or Anthony Harris starting at safety since you brought that up? And then a score prediction. I'm going to go 38 10, which was my score prediction for last week's game against the Giants. I know I've been saying all week long they could put up a 50 burger, but I think the, the, the starters will be out maybe by the third quarter. And so I'm going to go 38 10 as my score prediction for the second straight week. How do you see it? And do you like Harris or Kayvon at safety? I would imagine they're going to start with Kayvon and just kind of give him the chance. And then, you know, if he's struggling, then you go to the veteran break glass if necessary. Because Harris really hasn't played a game all season. He was on the practice squad uh, with Denver. But I know he practiced yesterday and probably ready to go. Wouldn't be surprised. But Wallace played a lot of snaps last week. Not that they were good snaps, but he was at least out there. Uh, probably some sort of rotation between those two. I don't think anybody owns the snaps in that spot. Unless Harris goes, uh, Wallace goes out there and performs and they're like, okay, this guy, he feels like, uh, you know, maybe sometimes you just need to know what your role is. When you get thrown into a role where you're just like, I don't know when I'm playing. Uh, I had 31-13. I agree. I, I think they kind of probably take the foot off the gas uh, not take the foot off the gas, but yeah, you're right. The 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 I, just the defense for the Bears is just so bad, and there's just too many weapons on the Eagles' offense. 
Uh, they can pick and choose who they want to highlight this week. So I like thir- I like your score. That sounds nice. I got 31-13. I think they kick a couple field goals. Fields runs around at the end, gets a late touchdown, and yeah, on to Dallas. On to Dallas. I can't wait. Um, all right. So we're talking to Mike Gill, 97.3, the Sports Bash ESPN uh, Sportscaster of the Year nominee for the second time, by the way. Make sure you go and get your vote on if if we can. So I want to pick your brain, uh, quick hitters here, Mike, and and, and get your, your uh, opinion on some things. So uh, the 49ers, not sure how much you saw of this game last night, 21-13. Uh, Brock Purdy with the little razzle dazzle there last night, finding George Kittle a couple times, and uh, finally for Kittle, finally. Yeah, I saw you had a little wager going on there. So, um, 49ers have won seven in a row. They got their t-shirts and hats last night uh, at Washington Christmas Eve, at Las Vegas New Year's Eve versus the Cardinals Week 18. I think they went at least two games, are they going to knock off the Vikings as the number two seed? No, Minnesota's schedule's cakewalk. Minnesota probably won't lose again. I know I'm not a huge Minnesota believer, but they don't have – they're not going to be tested very much. Um, the, I think they play Indianapolis, uh, Green Bay. Uh, they play Detroit – no, they just played Detroit last week. I know Minnesota's schedule's pretty cakewalk the rest of the way here. I don't think San Francisco – I think it's going to be Philly 1 – Minnesota two, San Francisco three, Tampa Bay four, Dallas will be five, Washington will be six, and then uh, Detroit seven. Well, let me ask you about Detroit because that's a big game this week. That Detroit Jets game. Yeah, and suddenly it was a pick 'em, and suddenly now the Jets at home are favored by one and a half. How do you see that one? defense man the Jets play really really good defense you just don't know what you're going to get from White I mean he puts up big numbers they don't have um you know they just don't the 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 Lions defense when they fired the defensive secondary coach you know what they stopped doing for Eagles fans they stopped blitzing so much the Lions dialed back the blitz and that helped their secondary out big time their secondary was a disaster and their defense has gotten so much better. Goff has actually played really well. Jameson Williams scored a 41-yard touchdown last week. Forget, he might have been the best receiver in that draft class. He had the ACL, but he's now back. I'm on Ross St. Brown, beast mode. Uh, they run the ball pretty well. I, I, I this That game's very interesting. I think the Lions have more offensive firepower than the Jets do, but the Jets' defense is better. I'm not surprised the Jets are – a slight favorite, but I kind of like the line. They've been playing probably them and the 49ers have played some of the best football over the last five, six weeks. Yeah. They'll be the team that nobody wants to play in the playoffs. If they get in. Uh, yes. Okay, this is, that's going to be one of the more fun matchups to watch this week. And uh, I wanted to pick your brain on this uh, giants and commanders game. They're going to do it again, line them up, knock them down. Uh, yeah. You know, this one though, the, the, the giants yeah. are licking their wounds off of a, beat down out at the woodshed while the commanders had a nice week off to game plan and prepare. Uh, how, how, how do you see this one? I've been talking about this game for a couple of weeks now um, because giants lead in the Eagles. I thought that game against Philadelphia, I know the talent disparity, but they were at home knowing they had to go to Washington after they tied. And then Washington had a buy to watch him again. I think Washington blows them out. I, um, I think, I think the giants are out of gas. Washington saw them. Tied on the road, bad tie by the way, but it doesn't matter. That's a win for both teams. They got to watch him again last week. They got to sit home and relax. So they prepared for them by playing them, watching them, and then getting ready for them for a third time. It's been all Giants all the time for Washington the last three weeks. A veteran coaching staff. I think Washington blows them out. Uh, and, and I say blowout. 20 to 3, 24, yeah. 7, something like that. Because Washington. Uh, I think it's just a better football team than the Giants are at this point. Yeah, I I think the commanders crush them. Uh, Let me ask you about Dallas. Obviously, Micah Parsons made a little bit of news this week. Uh, Jacksonville suddenly five and eight. I don't know. I mean, I I liked what I saw from Terrence uh, Trevor Lawrence. He had a career high 
368 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions last week. Uh, Micah needs to take care of businesses. And I'm putting the Cowboys on upset alert this week. Should. Uh, Trevor Lawrence is playing some of the best quarterback in the in the game right now. He's been pretty good the last couple of weeks here. Uh, they're starting to look. Doug Peterson, you think there's anything Doug wants to do more than knock off the Cowboys? He still has that eagle invigoration in him, and he knows what it would mean to his buddies up in Philadelphia to knock the Cowboys off. I like Jacksonville as well. Look, Dallas to me – uh, last week, look, I'm not sitting here on high alert because they barely beat Houston. But to me, Dallas still trouble against the run. Uh, they can be beat in the pass game. Their corners take too many chances. Their corners are not very good other than Diggs, who takes a lot of chances. You can go after him. Lawrence is playing at a very high level right now. You're talking about upset alert. I agree with you because too many – look – if you talk to a reasonable Dallas fan, right, a reasonable, they're hard to find. But if you talk to one, they'll tell you they need corners. They're corners other than Diggs, and Diggs gets beat too many times. He takes too many chances, but they're weak on the corners, uh, and this is a tough matchup for them. Having to go on the road, you know, last week they were at home playing Houston and barely got out of that game. Now you got to follow that up. So uh, this would be a huge one if Jacksonville could win for Philadelphia. It'll be interesting, I'll tell you that. Uh, all right, last one for you, Mike. Um, where did I want to go with you? So, you know, I see these uh, snippets. Thanks for hanging out, hanging out overtime, by the way. I saw these snippets of uh, Mickey Mickey McDaniels walking around in his little capris there in, in, in the Miami practice with a T-shirt. I wish it was colder. And, uh, you know, I, I really hate everything about the guy, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> <laughs> you like how I said that. I'll tell you what, though, I like, I kind of like the dolphins here with the hook getting seven and a half. They, they, they kind of disappointed me the last couple of weeks. I think two is going to bounce back despite the cold weather. Uh, this does have playoff ramifications up in Buffalo. How do you see it? I think the dolphins are in the tailspin, man. I was a dolphins guy earlier I actually – I do a thing on my show called the Fine Five, Ugly Five. I had them in my Fine Five up to number three at one point. I love the coach, by the way, and I love the offense, <laughs> and they have been figured out. They are figured out. Tua was horrendous last week. Now, that doesn't mean he's bad. He was horrendous last week. I think that team is starting to sputter a little bit. And, by the way, them going to Buffalo after beating Buffalo in Miami, no way, dude. Uh, that's a team that they're going to look at that cold weather and be like, you know what? We'll save it for next week. All right. Well, it, they're, that's the procrastination team. We'll put it off till next week. I think they get smoked this week, actually. Yeah, I think, too, it made me laugh, too. I think he said, oh, it gets cold in Alabama, too. <laughs> yeah, 78 degrees it gets cold in Alabama. Look, I like that Dolphins team, and I think they're going in the right direction. Um, they just, I mean, look, they went to San Francisco and got their ass kicked, period, point blank. I mean, they got crushed out there, and that was Brock Purdy's first game. And I know Purdy has turned into a serviceable guy. They could not do anything against that team. Last week against the Chargers, they were hideous. I know. Hideous in that game. Uh, it's going to be, I think it's a tough spot for them to go to Buffalo. Um, and by the way, they were, this is their third straight road game, right? They were in. Yep. San Francisco. Then they were at LA and now they got to go to Buffalo. That's a lot of traveling from Miami, dude. No, I know. I think it's a bounce back week, but if they lose and the Jets win, like you say, look out. Um, all well, right. Oddly enough, New England is in the playoffs right now. Is that right? Oh, wow. They are the seventh six after they beat uh, who they, Josh oh, Arizona. McDaniels, good old friend Josh McDaniels. Oh, they beat them. Arizona the other night, and that yeah. put them into the seventh spot. New England, you know, I feel like everybody would say the Jets are better. Uh, there's a lot of teams in that mix there that we all – like they're new kids on the block, and we like them all. But old school New England just hanging in there, crashing the party. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, last one, I guess, question in. I don't think the, the 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 chat room wants to know would the Eagles play their starters against the Saints just to secure a better draft pick. I don't think <laughs> Nick Sirianni and company are worried about that. They got business at hand, so uh, I think it's safe to say though they're not going to play their starters just to to secure the draft well, pick. Well, right? I don't know. I mean, I think you almost have to think about playing them for a half. I mean, you can't have them not play for three straight weeks, right? Yeah. No, I agree. 
So sure, you're yeah. almost treating that like a like uh the second, I guess it would be now, uh, because there's three preseason, like a preseason games. Game. Yeah. Right, where you're playing them for a half. You know, that's interesting though, about the because if you beat the Saints, that helps your draft practice. And we've seen the Eagles in the past use games to improve their draft stock. So I wouldn't <laughs> put that out of the um the you know, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibilities, but part of that is they got to get some reps. You got to get the, the the bullets flying at you. You can't have these guys sitting on the sideline for three straight weeks. That's a tough position to be in where you've clinched by that time of the season. And there's so much, you know, because keep in mind, the number one seed is the only team now that gets a buy. Yeah. No, I, I, I've been echoing this all week long. It's really a month because if you factor in Saints is a week, Giants is a week, the bye week is a week. By the time you get to that first game in the playoffs, a whole week has gone by. It's a month where you don't and, play. You know, we just saw this in baseball, not to compare the two, but the two teams that sat for the week, Atlanta and L.A., both got beat in the in the playoffs because yeah. the teams were playing. There's been this balance over the years, the wild card team. In football, generally, you're only sitting out one week because you have a bye. You're used to that. You ain't used to sitting out three weeks potentially, though. That's a different story. No, it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a topic of conversation. If we have you back, hopefully next week we'll uh, chop it up and break it down, and uh, we'll be a week closer. It'll be Christmas week next week. Oh my God, uh, the year is just flying by. But uh, playoff football is around the corner. December football. Buckle up, Mike Gill. Uh, we appreciate the time, my man. All right, everybody. I'll see you. Any, any parting shot for the people? What, what do we got going? Your next show is what Monday. Buckle up. I'll be back all Monday at Ocean. I'm actually going to Ocean tonight for dinner. I'll be at Ocean tonight. Where are we going? The Dolce? No, American Cut. Okay. What do they got? Steaks going on there? Yeah, baby. It's a Friday for steaks. No invite? Uh, Dolce I was at a couple weeks ago. Very good. Brother, brother, Highly brother. No invite. What's up with that? Uh, I'll be I'll be bouncing around afterwards. If you, actually, you can come find me. Um, I'll, catch you, I'll catch you at the tables for a little action. And then Monday, I'll be back uh, at the gallery. I do the show live from the gallery, same spot where they do the post game show, same exact spot we do our show Monday. And then right. there's guys do the post game show there on Sundays. So, and then I'm off Tuesday and Wednesday next week, but I'm working Thursday and Friday next week. All right, we'll I couldn't take off the whole Dallas week, man. Yeah, no, I hear you. See, Mike Gill goes to the ocean for the steaks. Rick goes to the gallery for the steaks, right? You see what <laughs> I did there? Hey, <laughs> on that one, Mikey, I tried over here. We'll get you out of here. Uh, appreciate the time. Go follow him at Mike Gill Show on the football playbook. We're so happy to have him. All right, there you go. Tone the shields the second, holding it down behind the scenes. It's the football playbook. Part 75 edition. Boy, we are moving and grooving. Uh, Mike went a little overtime with us there today. So grateful for that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll see how the timing goes here. I do have some more news and notes on the Eagles Bears. I do want to get into the NFL Week 15 pick them. There's no bye weeks this week, so we got a little bit longer to go. Uh, let's do this. Let's smash the like button while you're here. Uh, click subscribe for all of our show notifications. We're 75 episodes into this great adventure. Uh, we're going to pay some bills. And when we come back, man, I got a special, special three-team parlay for Richard Rosani if he's in the chat room. Buckle up. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this. Post game show with Seth Joyner. I knew that they had a running game. Derek Gunn. He has put in the effort. Devin Caney. Had we not won the Super Bowl, what would we be saying? And Mike Missanelli. Well, you know how Philly is. Post game, now streaming on the 6ABC family of apps. Fans on Earth. It's a bold statement. 
But would you expect anything less from Philadelphia? 58 years of heartache creates a toughness, a grit, a resolve not found in most. Sure, our prayers were answered, but now that we've had a taste, we're looking for more. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Number one, Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown is rolling back prices for a December to remember. For a limited time, you can own, not lease, brand new 2023 Jeep Wranglers for only $39.95 or $339 per month. New Ram starting at only $39.95 or new Ram 1500 Bighorn Crew Cabs $189 per month. Zero down can deliver. Get the price you want, the selection you need, and the VIP treatment you deserve. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, big finish sales event. Did you know taxes could be your biggest expense during retirement? Are most of your assets in tax-deferred accounts like IRAs and 401ks? Taxes are historically low today, but we're facing significant headwinds in the future. Do you have a plan? The Thrive Financial Team has more than 100 years of experience helping people across the Delaware Valley with forward-looking tax planning. Learn how to shift your money from forever tax to no or low tax accounts. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Go for the beers, go for the cheers, go for the hit and the hits, go for the scene, go for the screens, go for the gallery, go for the win, go to ocean. Back at it again, it's the Football Playbook TFP with your boy RIC in a place to be broadcasting live from the Jersey Shore around the universe. It's all brought to you by Ocean Casino Resorts, your home for the Pond La Hockey Eagles pre and post game. This weekend, it's all going down. Man, Mike Gill uh, gave us a solid uh, 40, gave us a 40 burger there, 45 minutes of uh, straight power. Um, we've got about 45 minutes left to go in the show. Hey, Halfway down, you know what time it is. It's the roll call. Uh, where are you checking in from? What part of the country? What part of the globe? What part of the world? It's the international show here on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. The football playbook. We got global listeners all over the world. And appreciate all the love and support in the chat room. I know you guys are working on trying to get our likes up in the algorithm. Uh, Go Sixers said we had 60 likes yesterday. I don't know, Tone. Hopefully we can get our weight up. Uh, set that uh Season high, career high, 99 likes. Are we going to get the uh, the 100 the hundred spot? If we do, I know you got my back. But, yo, let us know where you're checking in on this Football Friday affair, whether you're a regular listener, first-time listener, occasional listener, first-time, long-time, new to the show. Hey, let me know, two-part question, where you're checking in from, who's got the best barbecue since we uh, started up a barbecue uh, debate here. And uh, where are we going for the barbecue? I, You know, St. Louis is a good one. Texas is pretty good. Carolina, I think, is underrated. Very underrated Carolina. St. Louis is up there. Um, I would probably have to put St. Louis, from what I've experienced, St. Louis and Carolina, very close. Texas, there's a lot of different versions down in Texas. You can get carried away down there. Nothing really knocked my socks off. I'll say I'm going to put St. Louis up there and then Carolina, but maybe I'm leaving somebody out. You guys let me know. Emmanuel Gomez is checking in from Modesto, California. I can't wait to get out back to Cali January 28th for the 11th annual NFL PA Collegian Bowl. Stephen Paparo, Garnet Valley, Pennsylvania. How far is that from Philly? Uh, have yet to been there. Uh, Jared Ford is from St. Louis, but he has to say Memphis. Good one. I have not been to Memphis. I know it's close to St. Louis. I did not get to that part uh, of the country. So, okay, we got to vote from for, for Memphis from a St. Louis native. Impressive. Um, Philly T. Noise right here in Philly, Philly Dilly. Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I was uh, I was like wakeboarding 
on the way to dropping Oceana off to school. I mean, the, the water was literally halfway up my car with all the flooding that we had here at the Jersey Shore. Uh, a lot of roads closed off as well. Traverse City, William Stark, uh, Michigan. And he said his, his vote is going to St. Louis. Um, Chris Strecker, Kansas City is a very good one. I know our guy Dane Vandernat is going to give the vote to Kansas City, which is very good. Kansas City is a good one. Um, Ravi Nayar, Eagles fan, lives right here in Frisco, Texas. Ooh, baby. Whew. You're living dangerously, Ravi. Um, 20 minutes to the Philly airport, Stephen, of of Garnett Valley, Pennsylvania. Let's get it in. Uh, oh, baby. Um, all right. So we got Memphis. I, I might have to reconsider my barbecue selection then. The, the Memphis, St. Louis, Carolina, Texas. I think those are our five contenders here. Um, yeah, dangerous living down there, boy. Woo. Buckle up. I know you got your cowboy boots on. Uh, <laughs> the work boots are in full effect. Hey. Um, I do want to get to the NFL pickums, a couple news and notes that I did not get to, uh, Tennessee in the place to be Richard Rosania. Hey, don't worry. I got your three team parlay coming. I got a good one this week. I'm feeling good. It's a big bounce back week. Okay. What did I not get to here that I wanted to put out there? Um, Brett Kern, we'll get our first look maybe at him this week. Uh, he he was out on the practice field yesterday for the first time, as well as Anthony Harris, who is wearing jersey number 41 for all of you out there keeping score. Um, number 41 in the playbook, Anthony Harris. Um, we'll see. You know, last week when uh, Reed Blankenship went down, I noticed Josiah Scott and Avante Maddox were kind of um, put out there. In that cover three, they they uh, rotated Josiah Scott, Avante Maddox as that single high safety in, in cover three. And don't look now, Josiah Scott, one of the uh, underrated players of this team, he's played 37% of the defensive snaps this season. You wouldn't you wouldn't know you wouldn't have guessed that probably. Danny D, Brick City, New Jersey. We just did the roll call, baby. Thank you for checking in. Just on time. Uh you wouldn't think that of, of Josiah Scott, but he has played 37% of the defensive snaps. Uh, Marcus Epps have play, has played the most, 99%. You heard Mike Gill say he's a big fan there. Um, he was also a big fan of TJ Edwards, who does have 115 tackles. Wow. Um, let's see here. Um Isaac Sayamala, I wanted to talk about him because we always talk about Jason Kelsey and Jordan Mulata and uh, Lane Johnson. But um, Sayamala, man, he's played 95% of all the snaps. He's steady. He's consistent. He's physical. He's got mental discipline. He's probably the least penalized offensive lineman. I think Lane Johnson goes out of his way to praise this dude each and every opportunity every week. Um, Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, Jeremy Sunday. We got Jeff Saturday's long lost cousin in the chat room, Jackson, Nashville. We got to vote for Nashville, Tennessee barbecue. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to shine the spotlight on some of the underdogs or the unsung heroes, but, um, I think we've covered most of the, the situation, um, the Bears defense, I told you they've uh, allowed the fifth most sacks, 42 sacks allowed. They also have the least amount of sacks on defense. I mean, there is literally <laughs> no zero pass rush on this team. A safety, Jaquan Brisker, who's missed a handful of games, leads the team with three sacks. As a whole, the team has 16 sacks. I think Hassan Reddick has got like 10 and a half. Okay. Um, the Bears are the 27th ranked run defense, and they've allowed the most rushing touchdowns, 27 <laughs> in 13 games. So 
and 4.7 yards per carry, 21st in the NFL, I think Jalen Hurts, you get a touchdown. Miles Sanders, you get a touchdown. Uh, Quez Watkins, another one of those unsung heroes, take the commander's game out of it. He's had dependable hands, speed, good route running. You see him show up in the blocking game. Quez Watkins, you get a touchdown this week. Um, you know, so, hey, uh, you used to shoot hoops, JJ, with Joey Klecko? Oh, baby, buckle up. Emmanuel Gomez, thank you for chiming in. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, Josh Sweat, I know Mike Gill said Reddick's going to have a big week, but Josh Sweat is going to be matched up on this Braxton Jones. I just can't believe this guy's given up 33 quarterback pressures. Holy cow. Where'd he go, Braxton? 33 quarterback pressures, 24 hurries, six sacks allowed. Josh Sweat, I think, is going to have a big week this week. Um, by the way, the Pro Bowl voting update came out this week. We didn't talk about it here on the football playbook. But quickly, just so you know, you've got three, three Eagle players leading their position for the top vote getters, okay? Uh, Jalen Hurts leads all NFC quarterbacks with 148,000 votes. Tua, believe it or not, has the most votes, 182,000. Um, Jason Kelsey looks like he will be making another Pro Bowl. And remember, it's a skills competition. It's just they award the Pro Bowl selections. There won't be an actual game this year. Um, Jason Kelsey leads all centers with 105,000 votes. Um, on defense, you've got Javon Hargrave padding the resume, adding a couple million bucks to his pocket in the offseason. He has the most votes at defensive tackle at 91,000. So you've got right now three, three surefire Pro Bowl selections. I would say Miles Sanders is a strong candidate at running back. Uh, by the way, Christian McCaffrey, what he's meant to the 49ers since he's been there, 32 touches for 138 scrimmage yards last night. That was his fifth game for 100-plus scrimmage yards. That's only the second in-season trade where you've had a player switch teams and have five games of 100-plus scrimmage yards. Only the second time in NFL history you guys know it was another running back, by the way. You guys know who that was back in the 80s? I'll give you a hint. He wore goggles. <laughs> Just gave it away to anybody over the age of 40. He wore goggles. Think about it. I'll come back on that trivia question. By the way, by the way, think about that trivia. Uh, Lane Johnson, I do think, should make the Pro Bowl. Um, A.J. Brown, I think, is a strong candidate. And especially, like, you talk about this guy who allowed 33 quarterback pressures. Lane Johnson has zero. Wow. Uh, on defense, I think Reddick deserves very strong consideration, along with Hargrave. I think T.J. Edwards should deserve at least consideration as well as Darius Slay and James Bradbury and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. So, I don't know. I think when it's all said and done, you'll see six or seven Eagles players named to the Pro Bowl. Hey, we got some old we got some old heads in the chat room. You got it. Go Sixers. Ding, ding, ding. Steven Paparo, Jared Ford. You got it. Eric Dickerson, Chris Stecker, Richard Rosani. Man, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, the Eagles fan base is so educated, bro. We got the most educated chat room of any football show on the planet, goddammit. Thank you. Um, I'll give you one more trivia to think about, and I'll answer it for you when we get to the Bills game. This one caught my attention. You know, you guys know I'm not a Josh Allen fan. You guys already know that. But he has 24 games 
And Jalen Hurts could move into this company. That's why I bring it up. 24 games, Josh Allen, that he has a passing touchdown and rushing touchdown. He tied, in my opinion, the greatest scrambling quarterback of all time history for fourth all time for that record. And we're going back now to the 70s. Going back to the 70s. Josh Allen tied for fourth with another quarterback, 24 games with a touchdown and a rush touchdown, passing touchdown, rushing touchdown. Uh, to me, one of the best dual threats, scramblers of all time. Um, we'll answer that trivia question when we get to the NFL preview, which I think we'll do right now. Um, Tone, do you want to take a break or do you want to just get into it? It's 1130. Let me know. Fran Tarkenton, you got it. Richard Rosania Paisan. William Stark, you got it. Stephen Papara, you were first. Good for you, man. We got some historians up in here. I like that. I like that. The super producer, Tone the Shields, is going to give me the authority to skip the commercials. How about that? I don't want to cheat you. We got too many games to get into, so let's do it. I'm having a lot of fun here. Andrew, Conrad, good to see you, man. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the big show. Go Sixers, Ocams, Razor, Steven, Spa City Chop. What up? Where are you checking in from, man? I don't know if we've seen you around these neck of the woods. I'll tell you, it's been a big, big week for the football playbook. A lot of newbies, right? And we'll be back on Mondays. We tend to get a lot of newbies on the Monday football playbook show. Um, good morning, Drew Nichols. Where's the likes, guys? Buckle up. All right, let's do it. NFL Week 15. Pick them in the league where they play for pay. All right, guys, we're 114 and 94 against the spread for all of my newbies. We're not just picking winners. We're picking every single game of the season with the point spread. We've got 114 W's, 94 losses. We had our worst week of the season last week, guys. Three and nine. I apologize. Three and nine is terrible. Uh, we did hit the best bet, which was your Philadelphia Eagles. So we're eight and five on the best bets this week. I'm feeling a big, 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 big bounce back week here with the predictions. Richard Rosania, double R. I got you covered. Don't worry. Don't go anywhere. It's time for the NFL Week 15 pick them. Let's get it started. Of course, I told you I got the Eagles. I got them heavy. I got them big, 38 to 10. I almost took them as my best bet again this week, but I did that last week. That would be too easy to do. we got to have a little variety in our life. But I do like the Eagles as the first official pick, 38 to 10. I think we're kicking back, launching back some soda pops at halftime, and everybody's having the fun. You get a touchdown. You get a touchdown. We'll talk about it on Monday. Okay. Dallas, minus four, heading into Jacksonville. The 10-3 and three Cowboys take on the 5-8 and eight Jaguars. Did you know Tony Pollard finally had a game where he had a rushing touchdown and a passing touchdown? That was the first time this year. We mentioned Trevor Lawrence coming off his best game of the year. Hey, you know what? I didn't even make my predictions. We're going to do them on the super duper fly. I'm going to take Jacksonville. How about that? At home, upset alert. Our guy, Dougie P, is going to have Micah Parsons looking like this after the game. Heads in hands. Heads in hands. Woo, baby. I got the Jaguars. Give me the four, but we don't need the stinking points. I got the Jaguars with the W, baby. Woo! Hey, Bird Gang, what's up? You, you with me on this? Uh, Sunday Night Football. Let's go over there. Let's fast forward to that affair with the New York Giants and the Washington Commanders. Both teams, 7-5-1. and one. Of course, the Giants licking their wounds off of that beatdown by the Eagles a week ago. The Commanders coming off the bye week. This is going to be my best bet. I don't think the Giants have a shot in hell. I think the Commanders are going to actually dominate this game 
from start to finish. Look out for my guy, Brian Robinson, the B-Rob. 111 yards rushing two weeks ago against the Giants. I think he exceeds the 100-yard barrier once again. Look out. The commanders are coming. They're going to knock off the New York football Giants. They're going to knock out the Seattle Seahawks from the playoff mix. The Washington commanders are going to be coming back around again, maybe facing off against the Vikings or 49ers in round one. Wouldn't that be a heck of a matchup in the playoffs? Okay, Atlanta Falcons, five and eight, getting four and a half points to your four and nine New Orleans Saints. We need the Falcons to win this for the Eagles draft pick, which currently sits at number four overall. Now, it's Ritter time. Marcus Mariota left the team for undisclosed reasons. It was announced the next day he'd have season-ending surgery, so they turned to Desmond Ritter, the third-round pick out of Cincinnati. What's he, 26-year-old rookie? I think Ritter is ready. He's been biding his time. He's been sitting patiently. He's had 13 games to sit and watch Marcus Mariota operate this offense. Hey. There's no film on Ritter, the rookie. I like him to come in here on the road in New Orleans. We're going to take the Falcons. Give me the four and a half. This could be a field goal affair. I think the Falcons have a shot to win it. Give me the Falcons plus the four and a half. All right, Miami getting seven and a half. Against the Buffalo Bills, the Dolphins eight and five, trying to hold on to their playoff life here in the AFC East. The Easts are beasts, my friend. Uh, this is going to have playoff ramifications because the Buffalo Bills are 10 and 3. The New York Jets, New England Patriots, there's a log jam in this NFC East. Everybody can't make it in the AFC East, just like the NFC East. However, I'm going to go with the Dolphins not to win, but to cover. I think the Bills could win this game. They should win this game. But I do think seven and a half, the hook. They might catch them. The Dolphins might catch the Bills with that hook. The Dolphins have a dark horse opportunity to win this game, I believe. Jeffrey Wilson, who was acquired from the 49ers, he had a career-high 204 scrimmage yards last week. He's now coming into his own. I think that the Bills got to be careful here. I got the Bills to win, but it's going to be close. I think the Dolphins plus the 7.5, I will take that. This week, one more time, we lost with the Dolphins the last two weeks. We'll go one more time with Miami, and if they don't pull it out, getting the seven and a half, they're dead to me. All right, Baltimore somehow is finding a way to win ball games. They're nine and four, and they're heading into Cleveland, who's five and eight, and the Browns are favored by two and a half because Lamar Jackson probably will not play again. Tyler Huntley, who was eight for 12 last week, making the start. He did not finish. I don't know what his status is. Is he hurt? Is he injured? Anthony Brown, remember him from Boston College, transferred over to Oregon, undrafted free agent. Yeah, Anthony Brown finished that game for the Baltimore Ravens. He may actually get the start against Deshaun Watson, who had 276 passing yards, 33 rushing yards. So he went over 300 total yards last week, had his first touchdown. The Browns are favored here. But I can't buy into that Deshaun Whiteson hype. I'm going to go with Baltimore. Give me the two and a half. I got the Ravens to win this game outright and get to the double-digit wins. They're probably the best pretender, if I'm being serious. That's the Baltimore Ravens. J.K. Dobbins came back in a big, big way. 120 rushing yards last week. Uh, Gus the Bus Edwards had 66 rushing yards. I think Baltimore looks to continue the ground and pound. And I think the Ravens, they just continue to find a way to eke it out. Another one bites the dust. Give me the Ravens plus the two and a half. All right. Keeping it in the AFC, Kansas City, minus 14 and a half. Heading into Houston, the Chiefs have won 10 games. The Texans have lost 11 games. Um, you know what? We saw what happened with the Cowboys. The Texans are very bad. They're very bad, but 14 and a half is a lot of points. I think the Texans will keep it closer than that at home. I'm going to take, you know, the Chiefs, when they're favored by these big point spreads, typically don't cover. Now, Mahomes had 352 touchdowns last week, or 352 passing yards. That would have been a lot of touchdowns. Three touchdowns. Pacheco, 
Vineland, New Jersey native, 93 scrimmage yards. Hey, Jarek McKinnon, you want to go talk about a feel-good story? He had 134 scrimmage yards last week. Talk about the trials and tribulations of Jarek McKinnon. What a great backstory. And then Juju Smith-Schuster coming in, coming on strong late in the season. He had nine catches last week, 74 yards and a touchdown. I think the Chiefs win it. But give me the Texans one last time. I'll take the 14 and a half. It's just too many points here on any given Sunday. All right. The Patriots, seven and six, who right now are in that playoff mix. Uh, They're getting one and a half against the Las Vegas Raiders. Bill Belichick has a history for beating his pupils, Josh McDaniels being one of them. The Raiders have strung together some wins. They're five and eight. Josh Jacobs leads the league in rushing with over 1,400 yards, but Ramondre Stevenson's pretty good here for the Patriots as well. He's got 58 catches. He was banged up last week. We saw a little Pierre Strong. We saw a little uh, Kevin Harris out of South Carolina. New England's got that rotational backfield grooving. Mac Jones hasn't thrown an interception in like four games. Oh, this is a tough one. I'm going to go New England here to win, despite being the underdog on the road, traveling cross country. I think the Patriots find a way to win this matchup. Give me New England plus the one and a half, but I like them to win out. Right. All right. Last one in the AFC. You've got the Titans getting three. Woo. How the mighty have fallen. Getting three. The seven and six Titans traveling into Los Angeles to take on the seven and six Chargers. Hey, this is like a playoff elimination game, right? Whoever wins it is going to be positioning themselves to slide into the wild card spot. Whoever loses this is going to fall to 500 and have an uphill sled moving forward. I'm going to go with the Chargers minus the three at home just because it's a home game. I hear... That John Robinson GM firing the fallout that's going to come and the stories we're going to hear. I heard it got ugly there at the end between Mike Rabel and John Robinson. I'm waiting to hear the details. And for that, I'm going to take the Chargers minus the three over the Titans turmoil uh, to wrap up the AFC matchups. All right, let's get into some of the interconference matchups this week. We've got AFC versus NFC. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings, 10-3, and three, trying to hold on to that number two seed. Of course, the 49ers are red hot. They won their seventh game in a row. They're now 10-4, and four, breathing down the Vikings' neck. And I'll tell you what, if they lose to the Jeff Sundays, <laughs> they're going to be in trouble, this Minnesota Vikings team, because they could that could be the beginning of a downhill spiral. Uh, the Vikings are favored by three and a half at home. That's a tough place to play in Minnesota. I think Jeff Saturday is just in over his head. I know he said he feels like he's a candidate for that head coaching job. I don't know if Jim Ursay feels the same way. Give me the Vikings minus the three and a half at home over the Colts. All right. Detroit, six and seven. Trying to keep those playoff hopes alive. Traveling into the Meadowlands. Seven and six, New York Jets. I thought somebody in the chat room said there was a Zach Wilson sighting. No, my friend. Uh, The only time the Jets will score over 40 is when Zach Wilson starts, but that will not be this week. Mike White, who's played well and looked good in his three starts. He's 80 for 129, 952 passing yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions, 268 last week. I think the Jets find a way to win this one. Garrett Wilson making a case for rookie of the year. 868 receiving yards, four touchdowns for that Garrett Wilson. I think he finds pay dirt courtesy of Mike White. Give me the Jets. Give me the Jets to win the game outright and cover the one and a half over the Detroit Lions. But that could go down to whoever has the ball last, right? That could go down to whoever has the ball last. Is is Mike White out showtime? I didn't hear that. I did not hear that. That could change the selection. We'll circle back to the Jets. We'll get some clarification. I have not heard that. Thank you. That's why I say we got the smartest chat room in the world right here on the football playbook. 
All right, Paul Mancini, I know you've been waiting for this one. Carolina, suddenly, they're rocking. They're rolling. They're trying to chase the Buccaneers and win that NFC South at 5-8. and eight. They're at home against the Pittsburgh Steelers, also 5-8. and eight. But the Steelers have been playing well of late. And I've kind of um, doubted this Carolina team in recent weeks. I'll tell you what, even though Pittsburgh is getting three, this is truly a coin toss game. This game could go either way because Kenny Pickett is the Jersey Shore gunslinger and I'm getting three points. I'm going to take the Steelers. I don't feel great about it, though. This is one game I would shy away from. It could go either way. I'm going to go Pittsburgh with Mike Tomlin looking to keep that streak alive, never having a losing record. If they win this game, they'll get back to six and eight. And then suddenly, you know, the Steelers could have a 500 ish record. So give me the Steelers. I don't feel great about it. I'm sure Paul Mancini will come back on Monday and tell me why I was wrong. But hey, it's a close one. All right. Arizona getting three. The Colt McCoy led Arizona Cardinals. Could he take down Russell Wilson, the four and nine Cardinals against the three and ten Denver Broncos? The Russell Wilson touchdown watch is on. He's up to eleven. He's up to 11 with four games to play. We came into the season, Russell Wilson touchdown passes or Russell Wilson and Sierra bathrooms in their houses. Right now, last time I checked, they did not add any bathrooms into their house during the past week or two. So they still have 13 bathrooms in their mansion. Sitting at 13, Russell Wilson at 11 touchdowns. Who will win that race? We shall see. Give me, I just can't ever pick Nathaniel Hackett. So I'm going to take Colt McCoy, Brett Keim on the personal leave, Cliff Kingsbury on the hot seat, and Colt McCoy back in the saddle. Give me those four and nine Cardinals. I'll take the three points. They just might win this game outright altogether. And we've got one more. AFC versus NFC on paper. It looks really good. I did see Mason Rudolph may play for the Steelers, and Deontay Johnson is very excited about it. Yes, there's a shot. Um, this is the last game we're going to preview for the day. It's going to be the Cincinnati Bengals at the Tampa Bay Bucks. The Bengals are 9-4. and four. The Bucks are 6-7. and seven. Jim Nance, Tony Romo on the call. I got news for you. On paper, it looks compelling. Joe Cool. Joe Burrow versus Tom Brady. The modern day Joe Cool. I'll tell you. At the beginning of the season, we were going to say, hey, this looks like a heavyweight affair. But I'll tell you what, the Bengals going into Tampa favored by three and a half. This is going to be a beatdown. You heard it here first. And Richard Rosania, get the pen out. The Cincinnati Bengals are my best bet for week 15 in the National Football League. We're going to go with the Bengals. We're going to go with the Commanders, who were close to being my best bet. It's a coin toss, really. I love the Bengals. I love the Commanders. And I love me, the Philadelphia Eagles. Richard Rosania, baby, that's a winner. That's a winner right there. Commanders, Bengals, Eagles. That is your three-team money-making parlay for week number 15. <laughs> you know, go Sixers. It's funny. I saw a recent interview with Joe Montana. I think it was on the NFL Network, and they asked him about that same exact question, like, are you cool with Joey Burrow taking your nickname, Joe Cool? And <laughs> Montana, man, he's so laid back. He's so Cali cool. Uh, he's like, yo, he can have it. It's all good. It's all good. I got my rings. And I'll tell you what, Joey Burrow's might be the closest thing I've seen since Joe Cool, Joey Montana. Tom Brady, he's just in a league of his own. Hey, appreciate, appreciate you, Jared. Appreciate you, Adams. Appreciate you, Richard Rosania. Please, please bring the meatballs to the January 1st tailgate takeover. It's going down. 
at the link against the Saints. We're going to celebrate. We're going to regulate. And just like we do each and every episode here on the Football Playbook, we're going to educate. We'll be back at it again Monday. Hey, there's some football going on. I forgot to put the game on. We're an hour into kickoff. I have not caught a glimpse yet. Glimpse yet. Oh, 1130 it kicked off. The Bahamas Bowl. Let's get a little bowl game action in before we wrap it up, shall we? Uh, NCAA, college football bowl game season. I think there's like, how many bowl games are there? It's unbelievable how many bowl games there are this year. It all starts off today as we speak. It all kicked off 20 minutes ago, the Bahamas Bowl. Miami, Ohio versus UAB. Uh, UAB has got a heck of a running back, Cedric Thompson, who I think leads the nation in rushing. I look for him to have some big, big plays. This is going to be a high-scoring affair, I believe. The Bahamas ball, the wind, just like Chicago, the, the wind down there in the Bahamas, you never know which way the wind blows. So be on the lookout for that. That's today, uh, followed by the Duluth Trading Cure Bowl, UTSA versus Troy. UTSA, we talked about they got some good-looking wide receivers there in Cyphus and Franklin. Keep an eye on those young men. Troy has got a very uh, interesting center who is on the NFL radar. Uh, so keep your eye on that. That's going down at 3 p.m. Eastern time today. And then tonight, we've got some FCS playoffs. Our guy, J.G. Kinney, good friend of the show, he just got the North Texas Mean Green Head, mean green head Coaching job. But they are in the FCS, I think, semifinals against the powerhouse, North Dakota State, guys. This is going to be a good one. Uh, North Dakota State, Favored by nine and a half. Incarnet Ward might pull this one out. Uh, keep a lookout for that quarterback, Lindsey Scott. He reminds me of Charlie Ward. He is a he is a Charlie Ward clone. The quarterback for Incarnet Ward, just like Charlie Ward, who probably came out about 30 years too early. If Charlie Ward were in this year's draft, it'd be a very high draft pick. Um, that is your game of the day on the Friday, tomorrow, Saturday. Oh, baby, let me run through them because I love this kind of party. Are you kidding me? Saturday, just buckle up from 11 a.m. to noon to 2.30 to 3.30 to 5.45, 7.30 night. We got a six-pack of bowl games on Saturday, guys. Are you kidding me? Uh, it all starts off 11 a.m., nice and early. I'm going to make that Toys R Us run nice and early. Um Cincinnati at Louisville at the Wasabi Fenway Bowl. Two good programs with new head coaches on the horizon. Should be a good one. Uh, the Cricket Celebration Bowl. This is going to be Deion Sanders' farewell party. Uh, Jackson State, they're favored by 14 over NC Central. I'm putting prime time on upset alert. Shador Sanders, he's taking his act to Colorado. He is a potential first-round quarterback. Keep an eye on that young man. And then you've got 2.30, the SRS Las Vegas Bowl, uh, Florida versus Oregon State. Anthony Richardson, who is a potential first-round pick, will most likely be sitting this game out, I would imagine. Uh, we also have the Jimmy Kimmel LA Bowl, Washington State versus Fresno State at 3.30. Hey, Jake Hayner is a guy, I think he got a senior bowl invite, that Jake Hayner of Fresno State. He's a guy... He'll probably get chosen in the mid to late rounds. Gunslinger rallied back uh, the Bulldogs from a lot of fourth quarter back comebacks. I like Fresno State in that game. Then the Lending Tree Bowl. Rice at Southern Miss. Rice has got a wide receiver, Rashid Rice, who's a potential first round pick and also has a senior bowl invitation in tow. You want to get a good look at him. The New Mexico Bowl, you got SMU versus BYU. Tanner Mordecai, uh, if you remember earlier this year, he had a game with nine touchdown passes, that Tanner Mordecai. And then Jaron Hall out of BYU, another draftable quarterback prospect. You could see two potential Sunday quarterbacks in this one. That's 7.30 p.m. on Saturday. And then a little late night get right, uh, North Texas, taking on Boise State in the Frisco Bowl. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven games on Saturday. I stand corrected. Not a six-pack, but a bonus, baby, with seven games on the docket. 
We'll be scouting. We'll be evaluating. We'll be looking for candidates for that NFL PA Collegiate Bowl is uh, coming up January 28th. And, uh, yeah, that Cincinnati – Louisville game will be interesting as the Louisville coach Scott Satterfield took the Cincinnati job. Very, very interesting. And uh, yeah, you know, our Adams exploits. I don't know. I'm getting nervous about the Paw Patrol because first it was one, then there was two. Now Oceana is telling me that there's three different Paw Patrol lookout towers. So if anybody has some expertise, I'm going to go to Toys R Us tomorrow early and see if I can just pick them up in person. And if Toys R Us doesn't have them, I'm going to have to get uh, that Amazon Prime UPS on demand, uh, whatever they do over there. But, hey, don't forget the Manigault on Monday. It's Manigault Mondays here on the Football Playbook. Man, this has been our um, 75th episode. Buckle up. Uh, it's been such a great journey with you. 75th show with you here. We kicked it off in August. Zach Wilson will start Dynamic Prodigy. You know what? That's going to change my pick. I'm taking the Lions. I'm going to change the pick. And I think that line will change because the Lions were getting one and a half. They might now be favored. And I forgot to mention, Jared Goff last week, 330, three more touchdowns. Like, yo, he's going for his third straight 300-yard game. He's got 3,350 passing yards, 22 touchdowns, and just seven interceptions. That Jamal Williams, 14 rushing touchdowns. Jamison, the wide receiver, a 41-yard touchdown. Give me the Lions. I'm changing my pick. I can't get on board with the New York Wilsons, so I'm going with the Lions. And with that, Mike White has got the rib injury. I'll be eating the ribs over at the sawmill for the pig roast. Anybody who's down here at the Jersey Shore, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great weekend. We'll celebrate with another Victory Monday and your 13-1 and Philadelphia Eagles. Buckle up. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles.